In the summer of 2016, my son Brad and I, we went to that glass pyramid museum in Paris called the Louvre, you know, and with the terrorist events that France had experienced earlier that year, getting into the Louvre was quite a feat. First, we had to make our way through a phalanx of guards with automatic assault rifles, and then through full body uh, metal scan detectors, and that was just to buy a ticket. You know, the French had this place locked down. You know, the Louvre, it's the world's largest museum. And that day, Brad and I, we tried to see it all. We explored the Greek, Roman, and Egyptian wings, the, the African, Italian, and, and French wings, the Asian and Spanish wings. And then we found ourselves in the basement, in a secluded area where the French keep the American wing. But the door to America was closed. Closed! <laughs> like the door to the entire wing was shut. Brad said, can you believe this? The masterpieces of America are locked up, Dad. And as if to check, I pulled on the handle of the giant doors, and I discovered they weren't locked. Now, you need to know something about Brad. He intuitively knows that, that if a door is shut and the lights are low, that the American wing was not open to the public. Of course, you also need to know something about Brad's dad. If the doors are open, I'm going in. And in we went. Brad and Dad walking through the American wing alone in the most secure museum in the world. Full access, no guards, hallway lights low, but the art lit up. It, it took an hour each to, to navigate the crowded other wings. But here in America, we are crowd free. In 30 minutes, we saw it all. I mean, you cannot keep the Harrises out of America. <laughs> but apparently, you can lock them in. When we got back to the big doors, they were locked. We were locked in the Louvre, and Brad sat down on the floor, and he says, Dad, nobody knows we're here. What, what if they don't open this wing for months? I said, chill, Brad. You know, I'll just call the Louvre. I'll ask him to get us out. Dad, you don't speak French. Oh, yeah. So for the next few hours, as the Louvre is getting closer and closer to closing time, Brad and I are locked in, and we're thinking, what is the media going to say when we land in a French jail, you know? Headline, pastor and son, loot the Louvre, you know? We almost had our own night at the museum with, with Ben Stiller, you know? Yeah, it, when the Harris dad does something stupid, he does it well. You ever do something stupid? I bet we could spend the entire day swapping stories of stupidity. But, but here's the headline for today. You won't think it's true when you hear it, but here it is. Here's what I want you to know. If you don't know how stupid you are, you'll never know how valuable you are. Now, that sounds wrong, but it's right. It's true. And it's the major lesson from today's story of Jesus. It's found in John chapter 10, verse 11. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. Hey, so when he sees the wolf coming, he just abandons the sheep. He runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. But I'm the good shepherd and I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. You say, Ray, this is kind of tender. This is kind of nice. I, I don't see an insult here. Well, yeah, it's nice. Jesus paints a picture of a shepherd and his sheep, and the shepherds know their sheep even from afar. I mean, that's a big part of Jesus's point. He knows his sheep better than anyone. Most of us, we've never been a shepherd. So, so let me just put it in language that we get. Imagine you get to go watch your son play high school football, and you get there before the game. You take your spot in the stands, and you watch 100 kids in helmets and full football uniforms. Two teams start their warm-ups. And of course, you, you look for your kid. You know your son's number, but as you survey the field, there's not a kid on the field in either team with that number. Parents, if your son was on the field, would you be able to spot him even without the number? <laughs> Absolutely. You know his height, his weight, his gait, his friends. You know everything about him. You've parented that kid for 16, 17 years. You know all about him. Doug McMillan, who was a shepherd in our 21st century, said if he were standing 50 yards away at a flock of 100 sheep, he could identify every one of those sheep by name. And he said he could position himself on a ridge so he could make eye contact with every sheep there because sheep had to know that they were being watched. See, shepherds are, are different than horse trainers because, you know, horses, you know, they don't need somebody watching over them all the time. But sheep do. Sheep, they can fall over on their back and they can't get up. Oh, sheep, you're so stupid. Come on, over you go. How did you get like that? Push it. How far?
oh, I can't get up. Some sheep are, are like this guy, right? They fall in a crevice. And well, let me just show you the clip. You got to see it. Now, why do the shepherds of sheep need to observe their sheep 24-7, 365? Why is being a shepherd very different than being in charge of any other animal? Well, it's not a compliment. Sheep are stupid. In fact, if you let any animal loose, a chicken, a dog, a cat, a horse, a, a camel, they, they all do one of two things. They either go wild, like born free, you know, they're running through the yard, or if they're de domesticated, they'll just go home. They'll just go back to where the food is, you know? They either go wild or they go home. But not sheep. Sheep are stupid. And sheep is what Jesus calls us. I mean, this is the insult. Jesus did not call us dogs or cats or horses or giraffes. Jesus, who knows us better than anyone, calls us sheep. And he did it on purpose, which means we have to realize how stupidly helpless we are. Theologically, this is called the doctrine of sin. We're helpless. And listen, if you don't get this, if you don't know how stupid you are, you'll never know how valuable you are. Are you still not buying that? Let me help. Sheep follow each other and lose the direction in the ways that, you know, cats and dogs do not. Like, even when you find them, it's very difficult to round sheep up. Like, lost sheep, they just run to and fro in a panic. I mean, you've never seen a herd, a herd of wild sheep. They're just too slow to be wild. They're just helpless, weak animals. So, so what is Jesus saying to us when he calls us sheep? Jesus is making two key observations about us idiot sheep. The first is in verse 12. It says, the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. Jesus says, A, we understate our vulnerability. We can be attacked. We can be scattered. We're completely helpless without the shepherd. Just clueless sheep awaiting our slaughter. If we have no protector, no guidance, no shepherd, then, yeah, we're toast. And it's not pleasant to think about because, you know, we want to be right. We want to be smart. But you and I, we make a lot of bad choices and wrong decisions. I mean, think about your life 10 years ago. Like, if you're 40, think back to when you were 30. If you're 30, think back to when you were 20. Just look back 10 years and ask yourself and think, you know. Think about it. Back then, you think about it and you go, man, I was so naive. I was so dumb. I just need a lot more guidance than I've got now, right? And so today you look back and you see your past self as how? Well, it's kind of a dummy. Now, if that's true, then 10 years from now, how do you think you're going to see yourself? Friends, you're going to look back and you're going to say, look, I thought I had a grip. I thought I understood, but I was so clueless back then. My point is this. We think we're being clueless. But Jesus is saying, that is the essence of your sheepness. You are vulnerable dependence. Doug McMillan, the shepherd, he says that when the shepherd finds a sheep, the, the sheep don't even know enough to celebrate. Like, yippee, I'm found, I'm found. No, no, they just panic. They run around and the shepherds literally got to tackle them. <laughs> That's the depth of their sheeply stupidity. And it's true of us. We always need someone to help us. We're always going to be making the wrong move because we always think we've just arrived. I mean, we're 18 years old. We're looking at our 12-year-old school pictures on grandma's piano and we think, what an idiot. Good thing I'm over that face. But by the time we're 28, we think, well, what was I thinking when I was 18? The reality is we think we're over it, but our idiotness is perpetual. We're vulnerable and we don't even know it which, of course, makes us even more vulnerable. The other day, my friend and his wife, they were busy having a great discussion with two of their older children when their third child, a three-year-old, decided he'd had enough of long conversations, and he walked out the front door, down the street, and down the middle of the highway. And when a neighbor picked him up, he was unfazed. He said he wanted to go get some candy at the store. He had no idea how much danger he was in. He was vulnerable, but he didn't even know it. Which, to my point, means that his ignorance of his situation made him even more vulnerable. Here's a second observation. It's back half of uh, verse 10. He says, I've come that they may have life, and I have it to the full. In other words, the kind of life the sheep are currently living is nowhere near its high point. 
Jesus is saying that it's nowhere near a fullness. If it were, he would not need it to come, right? But the sheep don't know this. They think their life is fine. They think they're walking up the highway like a three-year-old. It's B. We overstate our image. For example, have you ever heard someone say that it doesn't matter what other people think of you or say about you, that all that matters is what you think of you? Yeah, I think that's utter nonsense. Think American Idol. Imagine a contestant standing before Simon Cowell and a huge audience of people, and everybody is booing them. They're booing the guy's song and the girl's song. And the, the person on stage who just sang this horrid song, they just say back to Simon Cowell, look, I don't care what you guys think about my singing. I know I'm a great singer. And you say, well, right. I mean, doesn't that like speak well of their self-image? No, it reflects on their inability to see reality. It reflects on their sanity, on their narcissism, or some other bloat of their self-image. The truth is, you cannot bless yourself. You cannot feel beautiful just because you look at yourself in the mirror and say, well, I'm beautiful. You can't say, I'm a great leader, unless you got followers who are telling you that you lead great. Someone on the outside has to bless you. And the point is this, you and I, we're completely dependent on somebody for an accurate image of ourselves. Whether it's somebody we've married or hope to marry or some parent or some boss, like a sheep, we're dependent on some person or some shepherd in our life. And then here comes Jesus, who says, not only that we're sheep, but that he knows our personal sheepness. Remember, he tells Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree. Remember, he tells the woman at the well, I know all the men that you've had. See, Jesus comes to you and me and he says, look, I've seen every one of your stupid moves. I've seen beneath all that swagger and bravado. I know how insecure and dependent you are. He says, look, I know you. And if you're a theologian, this is the doctrine of sin. We are like sheep gone astray, each of us to our own way. We're sinful. We're stupid. We're sheep. And the most incredible thing is that even in his awareness of how helplessly dumb we can be, Jesus says these words that highlight our value. Verse 11, he says, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is the second thing I want you to see here. We've got to realize our value comes from what was paid for us. This is amazing, especially in light of what we just said. A teenager once said to me, if my parents knew the things that go through my mind, they'd lock me in a basement and throw away the key. Do you know what? I know he was telling this to me. I'm his pastor. But, he, but here's something that every pastor knows. Let me just be personal here. If you knew the things that go through our minds as pastors, you'd never come back to hear another message. You wouldn't. It's true of you, too. If anyone ever saw every part of your thoughts, they'd run. You know that. I know that. Yet here is Jesus saying, I know that too. But I'm the good shepherd. And I'm going to lay down my life for the sheep. Remember, we just talked about how sheep are helpless idiots. But do you know the second thing about sheep? They were the most valuable of animals. That's why it was not odd for a shepherd to leave 99 to search for the one that was lost. Well, what was so valuable about sheep? Well, everything. They were, pound for pound, the most valuable livestock you could own. They produced the wool that you use for clothing, the skin that you use for coats, the meat that you would use to eat. They were valuable. Now look back at verse 12. It says the hired hand's not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep. He runs away. And then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand. He cares nothing for the sheep. Well, what's Jesus doing? here? Well, he's contrasting himself with the hired guy. He's saying the guy you hire, eh, he's only in it for the money, but not me. I'm in it for love. And this is quite the love in this context. I mean, like, like how many of you have cats or dogs? Like if your pet ran out onto Interstate 69 in the middle of rush hour, you'd be emotionally wrecked, <laughs> but you wouldn't jump in front of a semi to save your dog or your cat. I mean, my wife, who is the biggest animal lover I know, she wouldn't jump into traffic for our dog. You know, you see, Jesus says that when the wolves come, the hired guys who are in it for the money, they bolt. But I'm taking the teeth for them. I'm in traffic. Really, at this point in the metaphor, Jesus is saying, there's nothing I wouldn't lose to keep my sheep safe, including my own life. See, at the end of verse 11, it says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Do you see that little word for? 
Now, you can't get it across in English the way it's meant in the original Greek. In the Greek, it means in the place of. So Jesus is saying, I would lose my life rather than see you perish. This is pretty amazing. How amazing that the Son of God is saying, I'm a shepherd and you're the sheep. So the idea that we're stupid sheep, well, that's pretty insulting. None of us like the idea that we're idiots who absolutely need somebody. But the idea that we are Jesus's treasure, wow, wow. I mean, Jesus owns everything, like, like everything in the universe, all galaxies, all solar systems, all planets, all the wealth, all the expensive stuff. Jesus owns it all. But, but yet he says, you and I are his treasure. And so Jesus, he looks into our hearts all the way to the bottom and he says, I see something so infinitely precious that I'm going to die for you. He's so attracted to us that he'd die for us. Anyone like Sherlock Holmes? I grew up reading those detective stories, and in one of those Sir Conan Doyle stories is a story about Mr. Musgrave, the head of an old British family, you know, one of those that likes lives on a Downton Abbey type of state. And the old man comes to this brilliant detective, Sherlock Holmes, with an unsolved mystery. Somebody had been murdered for a bundle of stuff that they had found in the bottom of a lake. And in the bundle, there were a few coins in this old twisted circle of metal and stones. I mean, it was hardly something that anybody would murder anybody else over. I mean, the police had been out there. The whole family had been looking at it. Nobody could see why this bundle of junk had any value at all. So Sherlock, he's pondering this odd treasure, and he's looking at all the clues. And here's what he says. I mean, this is totally vintage Sherlock Holmes. He says, I understand Mr. Musgrave regarding it of small importance. As when I looked at it, the metal was almost black and the stones lusterless and dull. I rubbed one of them on my sleeve, however, and it glowed afterward like a spark in the hollow of my hand. I must congratulate you, Musgrave, on coming into the possession of a relic which is of great intrinsic value. What is it then, Musgrave gasped in astonishment. Holmes says it's nothing less than the ancient crown of the king's of England. I mean, here is this entire community looking at this muddy piece of junk and wondering why anyone would be killed for it. But Sherlock understood. He saw beneath the surface and he realized this is the lost crown of the kings of England. It has massive value. Friends, next time you glance at your mug in the mirror, you ask yourself, why would anyone die for this? But friends, Jesus looks far beyond that image that you study in the mirror. He looks far beneath the surface and he sees the child of a king. And Jesus says, I'm going to die in order to make you into a beautiful crown in the hollow of my hand. Look, I'm a reader. I own and have like over 4,000 books or so. And in all that reading, I cannot think of anywhere in any book where a statement of value like this follows the kind of insult that, that's laid out there. It's nowhere I've read, but here. But this is the gospel. We are sinful idiots. Yet Jesus loves us sinful idiots so much that he lays down his life for us. Theologically speaking, again, the doctrine of sin is now followed by the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. You're a sinful idiot. I'm a sinful idiot. But Jesus loves us anyway, and he gave us life for us. He substituted for us. Unfortunately, if you're unwilling to see how stupid you are. You're never going to see how valuable you are. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, there's no one on earth who's righteous, no one who does what's right and never sins. Romans 3.10 says, there's no one righteous, no, not even one. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned. That means nobody on the planet has ever done the right thing all the time. We all have moments of incredible stupidity. We know better. We know the right thing to do, but we do the opposite. Even the best of us, the Apostle Paul, the one who wrote more of the New Testament than any other person, he said this in Romans 7, 15. He says, I don't understand my own behavior. I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do the very thing I hate. One of the most educated, smartest, most spiritually astute men who has ever lived says, I don't understand my own behavior. I'm doing exactly what I don't want to do. It's Paul's admission of stupidity, of sin. Have you realized this about yourself? That although you know right from wrong, although you know good from bad, although you know spiritual from unspiritual, you still make the wrong choice. I mean, it's stupid, right? We choose sin. 
And not just once, if you're like me, you've got patterns of stupidity, right? Do you know this to be true about you? Listen, until you realize your sinfulness, your utter stupidity, you cannot grasp how much Jesus loves you, how important you are to him. Jesus says, I know your name. I know you personally. I know all the dumb moves that you've ever, ever made. But I love you so much. I've given my life for yours. Years ago, I was in this pastor's conference in Dallas, and en route to the conference, I saw this billboard on the highway, and it said, at our bank, we call account number 343-498-THOMAS. And the billboard was trying to say, you're not just a number, we know you by name. But at that time in my life, I really didn't think that was true, like, especially as a young pastor. I showed up at that conference, thousands of people in attendance, and the keynote speaker, he was phenomenal. And I had happened to meet him three years earlier, and I walked up to him after his message to tell him how amazing his message was. And he said, hey, Ray, so good of you to come. Hey, you want to grab a cup of coffee? I'd love to hear how things are going for you out in California. And I was shocked. <laughs> and so we did. We, we, we sat and we talked for an hour. I, I felt so honored. And on the way back to the hotel that night, I, I noticed the billboard again. And I thought to myself, if I felt honored and emotionally stirred to have a well-known preacher name me, affirm me, show an interest in me, what would happen to my soul if I let it dawn on me that my shepherd in heaven calls me by name and values me a thousand times more. Friends, we're stupid. We sin all the time. But Jesus, he loves us. He calls us by name. He affirms us. And he values us so much that he died for us. Let's pray together. Friend, as you think about your life, can, can you admit your own stupidity, your own sin? Until you can admit it, you'll never realize how valuable you are. Would you take a moment and go, yeah, that's me. When the Bible says all have sinned, I'm included in the all. When it says there's no one righteous, no, not one. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not an exception to that rule. Father, we pray and uh, seek you out. And knowing that what we heard, sometimes it's hard to hear. Uh, a message that, yeah, we really don't have what it takes to succeed all on our own. We're like sheep. We've gone astray, each of us to his own way. But God, you care deeply for us. You love us deep down. And maybe you're here today and you're, you've are you been listening to this message and you recognize, man, you know, there's been times in my life where I've been incredibly stupid. Maybe you've had patterns of it. Maybe your stupidity even goes to this week. Friends, you, until you realize how stupid you've been, you'll never really know how valued you are. And so maybe today that realization is a launching point for your relationship with Jesus. Maybe today it would be an opportunity for you to say something to him like, yeah, Jesus, that's me. I've, I've been stupid. I, I've sinned against you. I knew it was wrong. I did it anyways. That's dumb. Forgive me. Would you pray that? Just seeking the forgiveness of your shepherd? Would you say, Jesus, I've messed up and stupid. Forgive me. And Jesus, thank you for valuing me. I read in this story, I hear in this message, that you care deeply for me. You know me by name. And I want to know you. I want to connect with you. And so, Jesus, would you come into my life? Would you invite me into your family? Would you invite me into eternity? Would you ask him that? Just say, Jesus, forgive me. I want to be your sheep. I want to be in your flock. I want to be in the family of God. I want to be with you forever. Just tell him that. Say, Jesus, forgive me. I want to be with you forever. Father, we ask that you hear our prayers. We know on the authority of your word that you do. And so we're so grateful that you are the shepherd and we are the sheep. And we have a shepherd that eyes us and watches over us and cares for us, even in the midst of incredible stupidity. May we recognize today how dumb we've been, but yet how valued we are. For it's in Christ's name we pray that. Amen. Hey, it's been so good to be with you today. And sorry if I've insulted anybody by talking about stupidity, but it's true. Until we realize how stupid we are, 
we'll really never know how valued we've been. Jesus loves us. He cares for us deeply. And I hope as you read the Gospel of John, I challenge you, read it once a week, every week this summer. These lessons are going to resonate you with you like, like a song that's on repeat in your spirit. Man, that's my hope and my prayer for you. Hey, here's Deanna with the details. Hey there. Thank you so much for watching and checking us out. Hey, I want you to know we go live every Sunday, 9, 10, 15, and 11, 30. So I would love for you to like and subscribe to make sure that we can stay connected together all the time. I'll see you next time. Bye.